The Shenley Laboratories, producers of Penicillin Shenley, present the Encore Theater. The Encore Theater play tonight, Magnificent Obsession. Our star is Cornell Wilde. Tonight, Shenley Laboratories present the first in a new series of great dramatic programs. Some of our stories are fact, the struggles and accomplishments of great men of medicine. Others are fiction, stories of devotion to an ideal, individual heroism, or great courage. By these programs, Shenley Laboratories would remind you that medical science and progress is not cold, impersonal research or pages of statistics but a warm, human story told in living terms. Whether it's the life of one of medicine's immortals or the simple everyday record of service rendered by your family physician. And now, the Encore Theater presents Magnificent Obsession, starring Cornell Wilde as Dr. Robert Merrick, and Lorreen Tuttle as Helen Hudson. To me, Dr. Wayne Hudson had always been a legend, even back in those days when my life was dedicated to pleasure and very little else. He was one of the world's great surgeons and one of the world's great men. We never met, and yet his life ended because of me, and my life began because of him. That was many years ago, but I can still recall that dark morning when I came to in Dr. Hudson's Brightwood Hospital with a splitting headache and no idea at all what I was doing there. I heard voices outside my door, and I lay there in a cold sweat, listening. How did it happen, Dr. Ramsey? Dr. Hudson had gone for a swim to freshen up. He was very tired. His heart was overtaxed. We could have saved him with a pull motor, but it wasn't there. Well, where was it? On the far side of the lake. Young Bobby Merrick and some of his friends had staged an all-night poker party. Early this morning, Merrick decided to take them all for a sail on his boat. He was knocked out and overboard by a swinging boom. They rushed over in a speedboat for the pull motor, and Justin took it to them. If we had had it, we could have saved Dr. Hudson. <laughs> We could have saved Dr. Hudson. We could have saved Dr. Hudson. I lay there for days with those words lashing at me. I saw them in the eyes of the people who came to see me. I saw them in the eyes of the nurses and the doctors. When I began to think, I'll never escape them. Every time I read a death notice, I think, could Dr. Hudson have saved that life? And at last, I couldn't stand it anymore, and I cornered Nancy Ashford, the head nurse. Look, Mrs. Ashford, I'd like to ask you something, and I'd like to have you ask yourself the same question. Is it my fault that my life was saved and young Dr. Hudson was drowned? How did you know? Nurses are always under strict orders not to tell. No, the nurses didn't tell me, but I have ears and I have eyes, unfortunately. You're all asking yourself, what right have I to be alive and Dr. Hudson dead? No. Well, I'm asking myself that. I know my life isn't worth his. Dr. Hudson wouldn't want you to feel that way. No? Well, how would Dr. Hudson want me to feel? I think Dr. Hudson would say that if you felt responsible for the loss of a man, then you'd better find a way to make up for that loss. Well, that's a pretty big order, sister. Yes, Mr. Merrick. That is a pretty big order. After I left the hospital, I spent the days and the nights walking and thinking. I couldn't sit still. I couldn't sleep. I was confused and lost, and growing more and more convinced that Bobby Merrick was a pretty miserable character, and the world would be much better off without him. And then one day, when I was out walking, I met a girl. Her car had broken down. Hello, Hello there. I wonder if you could help me. She smiled at me, and for a moment the fires burning inside me flickered out, and I was almost at peace. I've always laughed at people who talked about love at first sight. But her smile went straight to my heart, 
and stayed there. I took all the time I could fixing her car, and I was sorry when I had finished. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to you. Oh, it was nothing at all. I was glad to help a lady in distress. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't come along. I don't suppose that there would be a, a chance of seeing you again. I don't suppose I could call uh, just to see how the car was getting along. Uh, well, never mind. That probably sounded pretty fresh. You're lonesome, aren't you? Well, loneliness is only part of what's wrong with me, lady. Only a very small part. You know, my husband used to say, Did you know Dr. Hudson by any chance? So many people did. I beg your pardon. What did you say? I just asked you if you knew my husband, Dr. Wayne Hudson. No, I never had that pleasure. Well, anyhow, he used to say that all pain passes and that we grow by it. <laughs> well, I'm not going to preach a sermon. Can I give you a lift? No, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Good night. Wait a minute. Aren't you going to tell me your name? Oh, sure. Why not? The name's Merrick, Mrs. Hudson. Bobby Merrick. Bobby Merrick? Yes, it's a pity, isn't it? For a moment, we were almost friends. Or am I presuming? You are presuming. Good night, Mr. Merrick. I stood there watching her car disappear over the hill, feeling as though I had been slammed against the earth until every nerve was bleeding. And then once more I started walking. Hour after hour, mile after mile, I I didn't know where I was walking. I didn't care. I lost all consciousness of my surroundings until suddenly I realized that it was very late at night and I was cold and lost in more ways than one. I stopped at a house whose lighted windows suddenly appeared like a beacon. Yes? I I, I beg your pardon, but I, I'm afraid I've, I've lost my way. Well, come in. Thank you. If, uh, if I could just use your telephone... You look all in. Why don't you sit down and rest a few moments? Thanks. I'm sorry to bust in like this. I thought I knew my way perfectly well. Say, hey, wait. Where, where have I seen that face before? Oh, that's a bust of Dr. Hudson I made just before his death. It's for the hospital. You may have heard of him. Heard of him? Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He's haunting me. First, my life is saved with someone's lung machine. Who's Dr. Hudson's? Then they take me to a hospital. Who's Dr. Hudson's? Then I, I meet a girl, a very beautiful girl, and whose wife is she? Dr. Hudson's? That's right. Then I come here to borrow a telephone. There he is again. He's haunting me. He's haunting me. I see. You're old Mr. Merrick's grandson. Yes, that's me. Bobby Merrick, a name that will... Go down and in for me. A name that will go down. Now you go right to sleep, Mr. Merrick, and in the morning we'll have a long talk. I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. Good morning, Mr. Merrick. Sleep well? Why? I beg your pardon. Would you mind telling me where I am? You're in my house, on my couch, as a matter of fact. My name is Randolph. I'm a sculptor. Oh, well, of course, that accounts for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Have some coffee while we talk. Thanks. I hope I didn't cause you any trouble last night. Not at all. When I learned you were a friend of Dr. Hudson's, I was glad to be of any service I could. I'm sorry, but I can't claim any sort of friendship with Dr. Hudson. Dr. Hudson was everyone's friend. I think you should know a little about him and a magnificent obsession of his. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be a sculptor. You see, Dr. Hudson taught me how to use my life, how to make contact with the source of infinite power. The what? The power that keeps the world and the stars spinning through infinite space. It applies to humans, too, and once you establish contact with that powerhouse, you can fulfill your destiny. Well, I'm afraid this is all a little beyond me. Well, there's no reason why it should be. Christ originated the science of generating human power, and so successfully did he practice it, that he's more alive today than he was over 1,900 years ago. Well, supposing there is such a power, how do you establish contact with it? All you do is go out, find people who need help, and help them. Only it has to be done in absolute secrecy, and you must never let anyone know about it. Dr. Hudson lived by that doctrine. If you took it up, that would be one way of making up his loss. And there's another thing you might take up. What's that? His profession. 
I have something to tell you, Mrs. Ashford. Yes? I'm going to study surgery. You? Yes. You told me Dr. Hudson would say I should make up the loss. Well, that's what I'm going to try to do. Maybe I won't succeed, but if I'm ever to have any respect for myself again, I have to try. Nancy, would you like... I'm sorry I disturbed you, Nancy. I'll stop by later. Helen, Bob is going to study surgery. Surgery. Bobby Merrick. Yes, it does sound funny, doesn't it? Have you any idea at all what it means to be a surgeon? It means years of study and work. It means discipline and self-denial. It means much more than that, Mrs. Hudson. It means being able to look people in the eye again and to sleep at night. It means being able to look at some people and think, I have eased your pain, and at others and think, with God's help, I have given you years to live. It means being able to look at your hands and know that there's life in them and healing and that you're earning your place in this world. Where did you learn all that? From Dr. Hudson. Yes. For a moment, you sounded like him. She stood looking at me for a moment, and then she reached out her hand, and I took it. And once again, for that moment, we were friends. I asked if I could drive her home, and she said yes. And a lot of things seemed to be beginning, but they came to a quick end. It was my fault. She wanted to go straight home, but I was so happy to be with her that I went in the opposite direction. She was angry with me then. And when we came to a stoplight, before I could do anything, she jumped from the car. What happened then is still a confused, blurred thing. (laughs) Helen, wait a moment. (laughs) Helen, Helen! (laughs) Well, Dr. Ramsey? The operation was a success. At least as far as her life is concerned. Thank God for that. But there seems to be a depressed fracture involving the occipital lobe of the brain. I'm afraid she will never see again. No. Oh, no. She will never see again. She will never see again. The words branded themselves into my brain. They were always there through the days that became weeks, the weeks that became months, months that gradually grouped themselves into years. I went on with my studies, always searching desperately for the thing that might restore Helen's sight. I'd try to watch over her from a distance. Bob, as your lawyer, I must tell you that Helen Hudson's stocks aren't worth the paper they're printed on. All right, replace her bad stocks and bonds with some of my good ones. What? She must have a steady income. I heard from Dr. Richard this morning. Five of the specialists we wrote to have agreed to meet in Paris. Good. Hey, what time is it? Well, it's about two. Why? Oh, I've got to get to the park. The park? Yes, I go there every day at this time. Well, this is certainly a switch on the old Merrick. You bet it is. She came every day to the little park near her house, and I would sit there and watch her. She brought her Braille books with her, and she would sit there and study. It was a long time before I had an opportunity to speak to her, but at last one day, she dropped her book, and I was able to pick it up and hand it to her. Ah, here's your book. Oh, thank you. I didn't realize anyone was near. I was studying my lesson. Uh, would you let me coach? Oh, I couldn't do that. I'd be embarrassed learning my ABCs with a grown-up. It won't be long before you'll be reading Shakespeare. Did you know they have him in Braille now? Yes, I did. But how do you know? Well, uh, I'm interested in the Braille system. Oh? Are you a doctor? A fledgling doctor. Really? What did you say your name was, doctor? Robert. Oh, Dr. Robert. I'm Mrs. Hudson, doctor. Thank you so much for your courtesy. I I must be going now. Uh, Will you be here tomorrow? Yes, I come here every day. Well, I'll be waiting for you. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. You're late today. Yes, I know. But so many exciting things have happened. You've been so good to me these past months. I want you to be the first to know. I'm going to Paris. For a consultation? Yes. A number of eye specialists are meeting there, and... While they're having their convention, 
I suppose it's because of what my husband stood for in the medical profession. They've asked me to come. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Surely men like Rochard, Donnelly, Rettenbacker will be able to find the answer. How did you know they'll be there? Well, they're the most famous. I just suppose they would be the ones. I'm sure they'll be able to help you. Oh, I can't. I just can't tell you what it means to me. There's so many things I'm so hungry to see again. You'll see them. And I'll tell you something else. I'm very anxious to see you. All these months knowing you. <laughs> yes, I'm very anxious to see you. <laughs> watched her go that day, knowing that if her sight was restored, I would never see her again. And I wished that somehow, some way, I had managed to say to her, I love you. If there's ever to be a woman for me, it can only be you. And suddenly I was very cold, and I walked away along a lonely street. Between the acts of Encore Theater, Shenley Laboratories bring you an announcement that is vital and important. For today, penicillin is in the news. You read that Wonder Drug is now standard equipment in first aid kits on leading airlines, or that penicillin is playing a part in research on preventing of tooth decay. The number of people whose lives have been saved by penicillin grows day by day. Yet only a year ago, penicillin was comparatively rare in civilian medicine, and two years ago, Shenley Laboratories together with a few other firms authorized to produce penicillin, was just beginning to produce sufficient penicillin to supply the needs of our Army and Navy. Since then, constant research at Shenley Laboratories has produced many new penicillin products, from tablets to be taken orally to ointment for local application. These are already available and prescribed by your physician. Other penicillin products and other types of drugs derived from research on many kinds of molds are now being developed for the physician's use by Shenley scientists. Because of the importance to humanity of drugs of this type, Shenley Laboratory resources are currently being concentrated on their development and improvement. Certainly as one of the world's largest users of applied research in the field of molds, Shenley knowledge and experience will be useful in the continuing task of supplying your doctor with more and better tools to aid in his work of healing. And now... Shenley Laboratories present the second act of Magnificent Obsession, starring Cornell Wilde and Lorene Tuttle. Dr. Merrick continues his story. Helen went to Paris for the consultation. I followed her there. I was in that consultation room, though Helen didn't know it. Now, Mrs. Hudson, just fix your eyes as though you were looking straight in front of you. Now then, please tell me if you see a little light. No. The day before yesterday, she had definite perception of light. You say you perceived light the other day, Mrs. Hudson. I think so. Yes. Which indicates slightly less trouble on one side of the brain than the other. Just rest for a few moments, Mrs. Hudson. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, Dr. Merrick, personally, I wouldn't operate. And the rest of you, gentlemen? Nine, nine, it is no good for operation. Every year we make new discoveries, Dr. Merrick. Perhaps next year or the following, we may be better able to help her. But right now, an operation is not the answer. <laughs> Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert! Well, come in, come in. What are you doing in Paris? Oh, I had some business. Oh, uh, I may as well tell you right away. I'm not going to see again. Oh, don't say that, Helen. You're going to see with my eyes. I have nothing else to do with the rest of my life but help you to see whatever you want to see. Come on now, I'll tell you what. Let's get all dressed up and go out and do the town. I'll show you Paris and show Paris you. Oh, 
have some popcorn. Mm, thanks. Tell me some more about the carnival. Well, on your right, madam, is Katinka, the fattest lady in the world. She tips the scales of 360 pounds, mesdames et messieurs. And on your left, we have a sword swallower. Not really. Yes, there it goes. The sword is disappearing right down his stomach. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that for a living twice a day? One must eat. Yes, but not swords. <laughs> hey, there's a Ferris wheel. Come on, let's go right on the Ferris wheel. Oh. Where are we now? We're standing on top of a hill, and all Paris is at your feet. That music is coming from a little Italian inn down the hill away. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Makes you think of moonlight and gondolas and stars and romance. Will you marry me, Helen? Oh, this combination of moonlight and music can be a very heady, dangerous thing, can it? Oh, don't. I've never been so serious about anything in my life. I wish I could say yes. I wish I could say, here is my life. Take it and let me be all things to you. But I can't say that. I haven't even half a life to give you. You can't enter my world. And I've lost my passport to yours. There's only one world. I wish that were true, Bobby Merrick. You know. I knew the first time you spoke to me. Oh, why didn't you say something? Why didn't I? Probably because somewhere along the line, and I couldn't tell you when or at what moment, I fell in love with you. And if that operation had been a success, I was going to find you and tell you that Darling, will you marry me? Will you please marry me? It's getting late. We better start back. Helen. I'm very tired, please. Will you let me give you my answer in the morning? If it's the right one, I will. It will be the right one. <laughs> In the morning, there was a note for me at the hotel desk, and she was gone. She said, oh, it doesn't matter particularly what she said. She didn't want to be a burden. Thank you for the days we've had together. Thank you for your love and your devotion. Words. A few dozen of them that rattled emptily against my heart. So then... Then I had nothing but my work. And while it was exciting and gratifying, as time went on, I was more and more lonely for the happiness that had eluded me. It was a long time before I returned to America, before I returned to take over Dr. Hudson's position at Brightwood Hospital. Dr. Mary, this is a proud day for Brightwood Hospital. It's going to be a great pleasure working with you, sir. Well, thank you, Dr. Thomas. I tell you, it makes us feel pretty good to be a part of something that is constantly growing. Medicine and surgery have changed since I was your age, and they'll change more by the time you are mine. And always for the better. Hello, Bobby. Welcome home. Well, hello, Nancy, darling. You look wonderful. I hate to tear you away from all these compliments, but there's a Mr. Randolph waiting. If you could just see him for a moment. Oh, of course. I'll be glad to. Right over here. Mr. Randolph? Hello, Bob. Don't you remember me? Well, I'm afraid I... You spent a night in my studio once. Of course, the sculptor. How are you, sir? Please sit down. It's good to see you again. You've come a long way. I've got a long way to go. You've become a great doctor at a very young age. And also, if I'm not mistaken, you've given with real generosity. Well, you did establish contact with the source of power, didn't you? You're mistaken about one thing, Mr. Randolph. I didn't give anything to better myself in any way. I've founded clinics, I've donated to medical research, but it was for one person only who needed the kind of help that a doctor can give. Whatever I've been able to do was done in the hope that she might be one of those helped somewhere. Dr. Merrick, let me tell you what I've come to you about. Not long ago, I was in Virginia, and while I was there, I happened on a very unfortunate case. A woman who is blind. Blind? This blind woman, whom I want you to help, affords us the opportunity to complete a circle. She is Mrs. Hudson. Helen. Yes. She's critically ill. Helen. I'll go to her at once. hasn't rallied since this morning? No. 
All right. Prepare for the operation. We don't want to lose a minute if we can help it. They're ready in the operating room, Bob. Nancy, I don't know if I can do it. Bob! I can't hold my hands steady. Look at them. All these years I've been hoping, praying that someday I'd be able to help her. And now... No. Dr. Merrick, this is no time for emotions or sentiment. This is surgery. The fact that the patient is Helen Hudson makes no difference. This is a woman whose life is in your hands, and you can save her. You can and you will. You're not a man right now. You're a surgeon. Thank you, Nancy. Come on. Lie still, darling. Don't try to move. Yes, dear. It's very important for you to be perfectly quiet. Oh, Bob. You operated on me. Yes. My eyes. What about your eyes, darling? I... I think I can see. Just a little light. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, I am sure. It means that one day, very soon, you will be able to see again. Oh, Bob. You must go to sleep now, darling. You mustn't get excited today. Tomorrow? Can I... Bob, can I get excited? Tomorrow? Yes, darling. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is such a beautiful word. Tomorrow our world will begin again. And from now on, it's going to be the same world... For both of us. In a moment, we'll bring back our star, Cornell Wilde. But first, ladies and gentlemen, may we leave you with this thought. Shenley Laboratories, makers of penicillin, bring you this program in tribute not only to the famous men of medicine, but also to the one man whose responsibility is your health and welfare, your doctor. Today, your life expectancy is 15 years greater than that of your grandfather, and part of the credit belongs to your doctor. It is the purpose of Shenley Laboratories to aid by every means at our disposal the service rendered you by your physician. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Cornell Wilde. Words are magnificent instruments for the expression of thoughts and ideas, and simplicity is the soul of clarity. I can think of nothing at this time which better sums up the spirit of this Shenley Laboratories program than this simple prayer. The eternal providence has appointed me to watch over the life and death of all thy creatures. May I always see in the patient a fellow creature in pain. Grant me strength and opportunity, always to extend the domain of my craft. This is the prayer of the physician. It is ages old, yet today it is as new as the hope for a peaceful way of life for all the world. May we invite you to listen again next week at the same time when Shenley Laboratories presents The Life of Louis Pasteur, starring Paul Lucas, a great star in a great vehicle. Good night. Magnificent Obsession by Lloyd C. Douglas was produced and directed by William Lawrence and is broadcast through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, producers of Night in Paradise. The musical score was by Leith Stevens and the adaptation by Gene Holloway. Cornell Wilde appeared to the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and will soon be seen in their Technicolor production, Centennial Summer. This is Frank Graham speaking for Shenley Laboratories, producers of Penicillin Shenley, and inviting you to listen to the Encore Theater next Tuesday at the same time when you will hear Paul Lucas in the life of Louis Pasteur. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.